Hello, Lori. So, so after, um, I guess the better part of, of five weeks trying to, to develop a concept design of what this platform would look like, um, I, I hope in this video to walk you through uh, the, the not final version of, of this prototype, but where we have it after the course of this guided study and with the intention of uh, expanding um, uh, onto it uh, through the subsequent um, months and, and with you know, increased buy-in of my colleagues. Uh, so a large credit uh, is, is due to our new instructional designer, uh, Mary Boone. Uh, she uh, was able to receive my vision my, my layout, my concept, um, and work, you know, her suggestions in to that. And together, uh, we are now co-authors of this space. Um, and, that, and that, of course, will change as things continue to evolve. But we used the organizations tool, um, which is, not unlike a course design in Blackboard, but instead of a, a, a more typical um, breakdown of this open space, uh, we wanted to have you know, four organizing principles uh, be what determined the link outs uh, to additional bits and pieces of content. Um, and those were resources, uh, in teaching resources, pedagogical resources, uh, the newsletter feature, um, upcoming professional development opportunities, both internal and external, and a quick link to the discussion board. So these four areas um, are matched by links in the dashboard that would go to particular pages. So I wanted to just start with these and then we can work our way out to the other uh, areas off the welcome page. So for resources, uh, what we used was the netboard feature. Uh, it, now the netboard feature is um, very user friendly, and it is both in institutional and personal um, plan options. And I was able to, uh, you know, develop with Mary this idea of having for resources, um, a main landing page of tiles that could bounce off to all of the stuff that was in, or that is currently in the Google Drive and very uh, vertical, very uh, perhaps too many subfolders of main folders and just a series of vertical links that could be a little difficult to navigate. So what we did with the activity bank that exists that way is we wanted just to have a, a point of entry right away that, that could take people to uh, the bank of activities that have been shared by individual adjuncts and that we wanna make available to other adjuncts for reference. So clicking that would go directly to the Google Doc that is already in the Google Doc resources, but buried between or beneath uh, several folders and subfolders that would perhaps take faculty more of a circuitous uh, way to, to, to get there. So a quick access point to this content would allow uh, you know, adjuncts to hop in and explore and be a little bit more um, interactive with the content. So that was one of the main motivations there um, by having that be so immediately accessible under the resources tab. And what the other uh, main space is the, or the other, one of the other main tiles on the top of the resources space is for the adjunct faculty resource guide which is, as, as you remember, it's to be the rather lengthy um, singular Google Doc that provides like the institutional context of the school and 
you know, really the, the wider scale institutional parameters um, that the individual adjunct would, would locate themselves within. But that says nothing, as you know, about course or program goals. So by trying to kind of leap out into the institutional context from the course specific context, uh, it, we wanted to reverse what they were seeing first, they being the adjuncts. If they, if they see the immediacy of the community, the shared subject matter experts and you know, full-time and part-time colleagues, that and the discourses that they use in this platform, that can enable uh, a, a better affirmed idea of what their mission and purpose is and how to, to locate that within the larger institutional document. Now, a few things, uh, it, there were talk, there, the talks with, with um, the instructional designer at the end of this project, and we have a few goals about what we would want to include. Now, from the, the list of items that you provided, the adjunct document does have language on public, public safety, uh, but it's rather general and particularly um, doesn't account for COVID specific protocols that we're experiencing right now uh, in terms of how to conduct and manage classes. The adjunct document does also have language on PERPA, uh, but it doesn't have particularly uh, strong, clear language on harassment or Title IX concerns. And there isn't anything elaborate in any of the institutional communications that adjuncts receive um, pertaining to the president's uh, welcome or the overview of the mission of the institution. Now, where we continue to work, um, the, I, the ID and, and, and me, is we're, we want to go back to the main welcome page. And part of our goals uh, would be to find, you know, main links in, that we would put in this area that would outsource to the president's message, um, you know, general welcome message, uh, the institutional goals at large, but also RCBC's specific writing department mission statement. Um, there are at the top of every OEDO and 101 standardized syllabus, there is blanket language uh, about the RCBC uh, writing department vision statement as well as the particular core values that would appear across every one of our 101 and 08 classes. And that's something that we expect adjuncts to put in their syllabus document. While we have it there, we, we, could, we realized later in the game, it would make more sense to have this visible, this language visible here as well. So, so having the president's message, having the institutional mission, having the RCBC writing department language and core values for all 101 and 080 courses, having that visible. And then while the FERPA does appear in the handbook, um, having more of a, it, it, you know, in, and harassment is not really elaborate there, but it does show up in one of the sublinks that, that we have. So we wanted to put more front and center would be COVID particular protocol right now. So the college has a website um, that is updated public facing and includes all policies, procedures, updates, news, information to the community and students and faculty and staff at large about how the college operations are happening right now based on talks with county health officials and what decisions are being rolled out on a weekly basis. So having a link to that here, we, we, I think would be a valuable step, particularly at this time when faculty who, who might be new to the mix are trying to figure things out. So th this space here currently has a link to key people within the division, you know, divisional leaders, our dean, associate dean, 
um, administrative assistants, adjunct coordinator, and, and key people with regard to student services, student support, uh, and the instructional designer, my, my co-author here of the, this content, Mary Boone. Uh, so that is what we have at present, but we wanna, there, I mean, there's potential for more bits of information here on this right side of the landing page that can provide those further details from the concept list that you would include it in the original assignment description. Uh, back to the left side of the page, uh, how do I navigate the menu? Uh, it, it, just a quick primer uh, to reinforce what the four main organizing principles are of the content. And then again, to go back into resources again, uh, Netboard is what is integrated here. And as you can see up top, this is the main resource area uh, where we also have links to OERs. Uh, you know, as, as revealed in our conversations, we do have publisher arrangements right now for 101 and 080, but there is potential uh, if we decide to explore on the reading side at least, um, OERs that would basically remove the need to have to depend on, on publisher or copyright issues um, for that content. The problem or the challenge is that, it, that we're realizing it's very hard to reconcile that with um, instructor uh, academic freedom in terms of reading lists. You know, quite honestly, some, some faculty prefer to use ratings that are not in the public domain. So, it, and it might fall within the textbook that is currently used. So trying to find a balance there is difficult, but we, we're not willing to say that OERs are completely off the table at this point. So having a link that goes to our institutional language on OERs, we thought could be a productive um, space and purpose because it can show any adjunct who might be on the fence what OERs are trying to do, how they're you know, continuing to you know, work their way into more programs. Uh, but it has to be done in a way that doesn't compromise the integrity of reading lists. It has to be done in a way that doesn't compromise the integrity of program outcomes. So is, if we're able to maybe like develop PDs to that effect, to really reinforce what OERs are and how they can work, then we see that as a win-win because that's something that could work its way into the professional development tab as well. So, and, and then of course the library, having a library front and center, we thought made just perfect sense. And there is a broad um, framework to this page, but we would steer uh, faculty to the particular subgroups up here uh, library resource instruction is perhaps the first and foremost, because 101 as the highest enrolled course is something that every student virtually would have to take, regardless if they're working on uh, certificate only uh, experiences or uh, planning to transfer even before earning an associate's degree. Usually one of the very first courses that they take to orient them to college level skills would be college level composition. So having the library resource instruction embedded into that is how the library currently, for purposes of uh, statewide, you know, NJCCC uh, category, information literacy category assessment as part of our gen ed program assessment. One of the goals for the state is information literacy and one of the main assessments that we use is library resource instruction because embedding the professional librarian into all of the 101 courses, they that experience culminates with the 10 question LRI assessment, library resource instruction assessment. And those are based on questions that the library develops. Uh, and honestly, they were developed not really in consultation with the faculty, uh, but what we're doing now is we're taking for the current round of gen ed assessment that we're doing in the state um, for information literacy, I am isolating uh, a, a group of 16 English 101 sections. Um, and I'm looking at the documentation category on our departmental rubric. 
which is about, of course, the, the application of the, the reputable secondary source material. Uh, what I'm doing though, is I'm taking the LRI assessment results from those same sections. So I can actually now draw a line to how the students did when they had the library resource instruction assessment and what the end results are on the final research paper, what the documentation uh, skills are. Because if there are gaps there, then this has exposed you know, a, a problem in, in the way that the library does its assessment. Uh, so we would want to you know, strengthen or fortify a relationship with them in that way. So it, the, you know, the central space here for, for resources can also has two sub pages at the top, one for English 080 and one for 101. Now at the syllabus, um, we can bring up the syllabus right here. Again, I just wanna share my screen and make sure that you are seeing what I am seeing. Um, uh, here we go. Okay. okay, there it is. Okay, so this, this is the template that's currently used over Google Drive for all of the OEDO uh, faculty to, to, whereas we encountered earlier in the semester with, with you know, conversations with uh, other institutions that they would model Blackboard course shelves. Uh, we had tried that at one point, Gina had tried that at one point, that has not been back in the mix, but there are of course standardized syllabi templates that we do provide. And I mentioned earlier, the writing department vision statement and core values language. Um, again, having that present on the welcome page, I think can uh, be a smart move uh, just to locate the departmental vision uh, but also having language about the institutional vision and the president's message uh, it provides kind of a macro and a micro. So, so there can be, you know, the adjunct is really able to trudge through these various contexts of what they're trying to do and what their work should be about. Uh, now, uh, the, it, it, as we have phased out of the AccuPlacer, um, what that has meant is that we are relying a lot more on self-placement measures. Now, self-placement carries with it, obviously, you know, challenges that there can be, um, there, there, there can be um, people who can uh, have a radically different experience in high school uh, than the skill sets that they're bringing to bear now. So we always leave the ability open for people who were placed in Oedo through non acuplacer ways, through self-placement measures, which again is a byproduct of the, of the COVID era, to leave that door open for students to test out of Oedo, right? So we, we put a big emphasis on the diagnostic essay. The diagnostic essay is key for not only enrollment purposes outside of Oedo, but within Oedo, uh, because one of the first orders of business is to, it, on the first day, um, assess or quote unquote diagnose the skills, the competencies, the strengths of the OEDO students. So there is a whole process to that that Gina and Jess currently put on the faculty G site. But as you can see, so many links there that hopefully having a, a quicker, straighter line to it might be helpful. And my you know, credit to the instructional designer for not wanting to, you know, reinvent the wheel, so to speak, not wanting to do away entirely with these sub pages of the faculty G site, not wanting to do away entirely with the links of folders and subfolders in the Google Doc space, because it just become it was become something that that we determined was more of a need of of having a straighter pathway to it instead of having the faculty members, you're expecting them to kind of wade through so many links, right? So the tile feature through NetBoard really solved that. Uh, and then the course overview uses language, CLOs, and gen outcomes and core course content uh, from the syllabus. And of course, there are sample uh, scheduling links and other links to the syllabi and sample assignments. But these are already, as we pointed out, uh, more immediately accessible on 
the, the uh, main NetBoard page. Uh, and then the sample assignments as well, which I think was one of the things that we wanted to highlight. Um, it, so it really, the, the, it, 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 what the current G site did was it outlinked to the ALP Activity Bank. So what we might do, because the ALP Activity Bank is what we put on the front as the main resources and had it you know, in that backwards sideways uh, route in the 080 subfolder, but we might take it out of the 080 space and just focus on having it on the landing page. Uh, so that is the 101 and 080 breakdown. Now for, for, for the 101 page, there are, again, links to the sample assignments. Uh, we do have a sample schedule here. We keep it for 101 and not 080 because with 080, as you know, there's more of an emphasis on making it descriptive and less prescriptive in terms of, uh, you know, because you have to know what the particular challenges are or where the competencies are not shining based on the student's one-on-one -on -one experience and then target instruction to that. So there's you know, having a preset schedule works against that, we find. So, so having the sample schedule for 080 is not impossible, but we find it makes a little bit more sense to have a firmer, more visible uh, sample schedule for 101. And that's why for the 080, we don't really have any language um, for the, the sample schedule because we just didn't think that it, it was a productive move, so to speak. So let me clear up a tab or two here to free things up. Um, if you go back into the 101 space uh, off of resources, and we will see that the sample schedule for 101 is a little bit more prescriptive, right? Because at the very least, a silver lining is that it would enable 101 faculty based off of this prescriptive uh, schedule, should they choose to follow it, uh, what the targeted needs of their OATO students would be. And this is their baseline. So this is something that, uh, honestly, we have no hard data. We did not collect data that would show what percentage of the part-time faculty rely on this schedule or how often they interacted with it. So <clears throat> thinking out loud, that might be the next best thing to consider. Uh, but the suggested reading lists links to, again, it, how, where we are with OERs is that we are stopping short of requiring them wholesale because of certain publication or copyright restrictions, but also we didn't want to, to just have that be the reason that we didn't pursue OERs. So we're trying to really change the paradigm there over time. <clears throat> but these links are to readings that faculty, uh, full-time and part-time, uh, have used in their courses that are in the public domain. And they may or may not it show up as edited versions in sanctioned course textbooks. But if they did, they would be in smaller edited uh, uh, layouts. And you know, the faculty thought that the original version would be a more thorough reading experience. So uh, there is a vetting that occurs. We encourage faculty to volunteer titles, but full-time faculty are the final sayers of, you know, determiners of who or, or which particular title is, is going to be included on these lists. So, you know, it's, it's just, you know, safety precaution that we couldn't find our way around. Uh, even though there are academic freedom, uh, you know, potential, potential, potentially strong academic freedom cases to be made, we didn't want to leave that one door open for grievances or, or perhaps bad uh, outcomes if a student took exception to a reading. That being said, we have had very, no, in fact, none uh, of the titles be rejected for that purpose. So, and 
this is uh, language that is a little bit dated because we are now in the fifth edition uh, of TSIS without readings, but many faculty, when we shifted to that text, um, we're still using the fourth edition that we had with readings. So we provided a link to that just to facilitate any carryover. Uh, and that's something that I think is definitely able to be updated uh, in, in days ahead. Uh, and then the sample assignment bank is, uh, again, um, uh, uh, with potential, but not as extensive as the ALP activity bank. Uh, the ALP activity bank is reflective of the assignment exchanges that a small concerted group of Oedo faculty uh, were able or are able to partake in. That doesn't exist with 101, honestly. So I think there's potential for growth here, but we decided to, again, just push it out to this particular page in the G site for now. Um, and I think one of our goals going forward is to encourage uh, more of these assi assignments on the sample side to work their way into the 101 course. There are percentage breakdowns that are required and 25% of the students, oh, well, you know, English 101 grade is, is labeled homework and other activities. But this could be comprised of any number of assignments. So, you know, creativity is key. Um, and this does connect to some of the questions uh, from the survey, the cultural survey administered earlier in the semester about that. And particularly as, as it pertains to VLC contexts or you know, a, a synchronous uh, distance learning contexts, which are not going away in terms of how we offer these courses. So I think definitely there is a, a room for, there is room for improvement and growth here about the types of courses, um, I'm sorry, the types of assignments that are, that are encouraged and circulated in a sample way uh, that we can collect and point English 101 faculty to that are not just OATO related. So going back to, okay, I, I believe I'm still recording, that's good. Uh, back into the resources page, uh, the, the, that would pretty much walk through extensively the main the OATO and the 101 specific um, issues uh, about course resources, pedagogical resources. So getting into newsletters. Now, the, the newsletter feature, what the, both the instructional designer and, and I uh, were quite surprised by was the layout of Canva. The, 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 the Canva layout that could be provided for creating a newsletter that would match all of the best features and functionalities that I saw in the Northeastern example um, earlier in the class. So, so these are, uh, you know, I think part of what would entail making a fruitful newsletter experience is encouraging the faculty, of course, to submit articles and content. Um, so that could, that could be on a rolling basis. And it might be better to have quarterly or maybe once a semester publications that are rolled in here and have like an iterative cyclical process where we encourage faculty to submit stories across a wide range of issues. And this could be even recaps of professional development webinars or professional development uh, stuff that happened on site that we could get images you know, and, and captions and do write-ups from. So having more of an iterative and cyclical process to collect really meaningful news items for quarterly or semesterly newsletter publications uh, I think is more advantageous. And it's with the added benefit of being able to track reads through Blackboard, which provides that tool. Uh, this gets around a lot of the current method 
which is, I think, email fatigue. And this is not a, you know, this is credit to, to Gina and Jess because we're very informed. But a lot of the stuff in those weekly emails blurs contexts. What I mean by that is they'll have updates about like institutional wide goings on, but they'll mix it up with stuff that is more programmer core specific. And when that happens in a very, very wordy email that may or may not be scanned attentively, um, certain stuff is gonna get missed. So, so I think training or, or redirecting these bits of information from the programmer core specific side at least, and to the extent that it has to be something institutional, like a big institutional wide item, maybe any institutional news can be included here as it pertains to the courses or programs in, in this particular case. Um, you know, and not just for, you know, without having that link established. So I think that there's potential here to have the newsletters gathered in this way. Um, and we can just, you know, if, 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 it, if it's semesterly, if it's quarterly, um, to have all of them accessible and folded by year. So there is a way to get tracking, analytics, but there's also a ease of accessing past issues. Uh, so, you know, this obviously helps for record keeping purposes and, and things like that. Now, Canva is, uh, the, the version of Canva that is used here is free. So again, very low to no risk, high reward. Professional development also is what we use with NetBoard. And you can see that we had four like main links at the top of the page. Uh, one was general PD at RCDC. Um, and these tiles are for professional development of the whole person, not particularly within the scope of the English 101 or the 080 course, but college-wide PD. So these would outlink to the RCBC pages. Uh, the vector LMS is something that um, full-time faculty are required to do annually as part of human resource training. Uh, so this is currently something that in my last recollection is not fully required of our part-time folks, but having this out there uh, is something that can only enrich the, again, the whole person. Um, and the upcoming training programs uh, from RCBC are, again, wider in scope. Uh, they can pertain to uh, career services. They can, they can pertain to our workforce development institute. They can pertain to <clears throat> academic advising. Uh, and as you can see, what we've linked them to on our main website are various needs of our industry partners that can you know, reach any member of the community. So it's not just students uh, in the student sense, but it, it's not impossible that our faculty, our adjunct faculty can accrue, <coughs> excuse me, meaningful PD, uh, particularly if their day jobs align with any of these issues. So to go back to the top of this particular network, we also have English department specific and then external opportunities and then of course general Blackboard PD. So the English specific goes out to a video uh, that we currently have, <coughs> excuse me, that was from the Google Doc lists where Gina uh, walks faculty through uh, how to navigate WebAdvisor, uh, which has currently been phased out, but how to maneuver their uh, faculty data into self-service, how to interact or interface with self-service. So this is a video that was actually developed, but what NetBoard provides, which I like, is the ability to uh, input various types of media. External opportunities. There was a, a conference uh, on education pedagogy happening next February that we thought would be nice to link, but we can do tiles to multiple other conferences as well. Uh, and even if I, you know, what I can do here is I can plug in the next two-year College English Association conference. Uh, anything about the C's college conference, uh, on, on, college composition of the communication. Uh, 
and anything from NCTE broadly, or even MLA. So there are opportunities here to do English specific within or in the English department and external, what I'm still thinking about is can, would external just be broader pedagogical stuff that's not writing specific. So that's something that I'm still teasing out um, how these could be compartmentalized, but I did think it was necessary to have two categories. And then of course, general Blackboard training. And you know, with pertaining to course design, adding pages, safe assign, tool links, what we found very helpful here was that generally speaking, every course, be it virtual live, um, asynchronous, what we call at RCBC online anytime, or face-to-face -face courses, will have Blackboard shells connected to them. So we just want to ensure that everybody who is not really extensive in Blackboard has a space that they can get to that provides them resources that they can just work their way through one, one of the time, bit by bit. So there is in this tile feature, perhaps the risk that it's too many, uh, but I couldn't really justify um, any way to make it more digestible. Uh, maybe if we just had straight links, but not the tile with the play button, but I think that this is an advantage only because the headings make it so faculty can kind of jump to particular tiles as needed and hopefully not get too overwhelmed by that. So the final bit uh, would be general discussion boards. Now, this is where I see a lot of potential with embedding uh, various campus agents, honestly. We, could, we can promote and, you know, that testing and tutoring will be embedded into the discussion board for a particular week and maybe have a discussion board just for that, or maybe even have discussion boards set up for testing and tutoring, one for library resource instruction, one for the, the host or, or moderator, um, and just have these open all the time. And then there could just be a general expectation that people hop on and respond within like 48 hours of receiving the message. So with that type of expectation established, there shouldn't be a real need, so to speak, of faculty being left out in the dark. You know, because I know going into the fall of 21, we had a selection of faculty, um, adjunct faculty who were initially given um, on-site teaching assignments, but because at that point Delta was still raging, they requested to, to change either to asynchronous or they had to bow out altogether. So it's gonna take time, I think, to get a fully fortified, uh, comfortable base of people who know or who are ready to just do the on-site stuff. We have to continue to still uh, work with those who are interested only in distance learning options or in the virtual live options, which I don't think institutionally we're going to be doing away with anytime soon. So there, create, there maybe there could be a potential for a general discussion board for questions that we don't anticipate, but also having stakeholders be in control of various DBs throughout the semester and they could just go on and have us, you know, simmer, have a simmering dialogue uh, throughout the semester. And that removes the ability of certain targeted messages to get lost in email. And that allows also for like more of a cross pollination of ideas. It's putting multiple stakeholders in touch with our faculty to really get a firsthand account of college operations. So this in a nutshell is the prototype as we have it so far. Uh, certainly a lot more room for growth, uh, but I think, you know, we had talked in our last session about the potential for other programs to develop similar organization spaces, and I, I see the potential for that now more than ever, uh, particularly with regard to, to, to the point that, uh, yes, these programs aren't as heavily staffed, with part-time folks as English 101, 
but they have enough sections. They have enough people that if you were just to rely on email communication, you still run the risk of there being ga gaps or holes. And you're not concurrently strengthening their pedagogical uh, skill set by, <clears throat> excuse me, enabling them to maneuver and interface through these tools to see at a, on a deeper level how they're operating. So uh, it, it, Dr. Bond, it has been a pleasure uh, working with you throughout this experience and benefiting from your notes, your questions, your observations. I hope that based on this video, if you see any questions or potential, <coughs> excuse me, directions where this can go even further, I welcome continuing the conversation. Uh, it has been a pleasure working with you. Uh, and I wish you all the best for the holiday season. Thank you for listening to, to this walkthrough of the prototype.